Ready? Can you hear that? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, a video game music podcast. This is Podcast World 23, Episode 1. Yes, you've made it this far. Now face the final bosses. My host, my name is Rob Nichols. <laughs> what? This is my second form. Can you hear me, Pernell? What? Can you hear me, Pernell? I'm I'm talking as loud as I possibly can. What? <laughs> uh, and I'm Pernell. I can hear him very much. I'm just right. being a goober. And every week, you must defeat us to no, listen you don't. to the very. You got to hang out with us. Yeah, you, you hang out. Chill. With us. Yeah, we, we we chill at the bar in town. <laughs> we chill out here so that you don't have to. No, we chill here every every week listening to great video game music from all consoles and all generations and you know sometimes they get mixed up and we say the names wrong you know what sometimes my name is not rob sometimes it's felipe <laughs> and sometimes my name is not pernell it's lynn rip lynn rip um so yeah we are here um sort of but we're both here <laughs> our voices are here a little on the sleepy side though but we're getting through it's yeah been me a too. rough day it's been a day i know but I got um I got myself a delicious water ice, which I always find funny when I describe it because I did a Facebook posting of like, hey, I got this cool water ice today. It really raised my spirits and it tastes delicious. And then like people were like, is that an Italian ice? And then it brought up the entire usual discussion of like, is it an Italian ice or is it a water ice? Is it I'm a like, shave ice? What is it? <laughs> what is it? Like it- it's fr- and you're like stop tearing no it's a fr- it's frozen. frozen sugar <laughs> yeah welcome to professor purnell's liquid <laughs> frozen liquid emporium education center like, it's just, i don't know what else to tell people like just eat the stuff yeah and i feel like whatever you say mm-hmm. i will say that a shaved ice is particularly different that's one thing i will give them shaved ice is his own beast i feel like you're saying uh, a shamed ice well a shamed ice is a whole nother can of worms <laughs> and it needs counseling that's shaved what, ice yeah. is ice with a with syrup poured over it, and it just kind of permeates through. Whereas mm-hmm. the other two are variations of it all blending together from the start. Mm-hmm. So you can say it's harder frozen or softer frozen or whatever. The point is, eat sugary water. <laughs> it's delicious. It's blue, especially with it's custard. It's orange. It's purple. It's whatever your fantastic it's mind can picture. You because want it to be. It's all food color, baby. Um, it made me jealous. It looked delicious. I want to get out there now and get some water ice too, but I'm, I'm being real cagey about what I go out for. So I hope you are too at home. I'd be being cagey about that too. Well, a little bit of a pro tip there from on that based on me. Like I'm weird in the sense that like I'm very, I'm very, I don't want to say I'm like nonchalant about it, but I'm also careful more so for others. Like mm. I don't want to get anyone else potentially sick. Yeah. That's why I'm mindful. So what I do like, for example, with the water ice today, is that I usually try to avoid lines, but there are lines. I'm that guy that's, like, kind of, like, working extra time to, like, make space in the line. And if someone in the line wants to get a little weird about getting too close, I start acting real awkward. That'll make them (laughs) want to get away from you. Um, But ultimately, what it does is just, it's protecting me, and ultimately, it's really protecting them. So, I just kind of get all like that. But, um... With the case of this place, I went over there. There was no line. You know, the lady mm. was still working the booth. She had gloves on and a mask. I had my mask on. I was like, hi, how's it going? And we're talking the thing. And it was a very casual thing. Now, if it was like a huge pile of people waiting at the entrance to get water yeah, ice, you I would get water ice yeah. today. Yeah, because uh, that's not that's not how I roll. Yeah, I went, I went, I ordered a pizza from a place at Trolley called the Crowbar. And um, Charlie Square in Wilmington is like the like the hip kind of place because like there's like lots of like walkable restaurants and bars and stuff like that's where all that stuff is. And it was like curbside pickup, and the lady said, "Yeah, just just park on the curb, and I'll drop off the food." And I was like, "Park on the curb? Are you crazy? There's never any room on the curb." And she said, "No, don't worry about it. There is today." <laughs> and then I was reminded again that our world is falling apart. Um, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. But it just makes me more anxious. Um, and that's okay. I can get I can get past that. Uh, but I have some show announcements. I want to get some um, some stuff out of the way before we get into our topic. Um, Pernell and I are um, <laughs> we're, we're updating our Patreon pledge levels. We started our Patreon, and I put four levels of membership on there with a bunch of dumb names and a bunch of dumb 
like really silly like things that we would do like say your name five times on the show i would do an ms paint picture of you and your family um pernell would live his life to um to 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 better mankind like well, let's be honest here i just I, I, i'm fine with that don't <laughs> even worry about that one. Uh, we're at the point now where it's just it's just whatever you want it to be and i like that but there's actually some things that we can offer, offer, but things that we can do that I think that you're really going to like. One suggestion that we had at one point was going to be the potential of like, play games together or suggest like topics for the show. But let's be real. We can play games together for free. We can su- <laughs> suggest topics if you want. Yeah, we'll we're, take them. We'll do them all. We're, take, we're generally just free, open cats who are all about chatting with everybody uh, and hanging out. So don't worry about that kind of Absolutely. Stuff. And um, access to our live streams, if you... If you subscribe once and then and then unsubscribe from us, you don't lose that access. <laughs> you still get it. So wouldn't worry about that. Uh, but anyway, so if you are a $1 subscriber, you get access to our prequel episodes and you get access to our live streams. If you are a $5 subscriber, um, you get access to all of that stuff. And we say your name at the end of every episode. If you are a $10 subscriber, you get all of that. Plus, we will do a radio promo um, thanking you by name on our 24-7 YouTube radio station. And if you are a $20 subscriber uh, or member of our Patreon, then you get all of that, plus you can record your own promo and we'll put your voice on our radio stream on YouTube and we'll play it on the podcast once in a while. What do you think That's of that? Heavy. Honestly, the only thing I request is if you do, if we were, if we play it on the show proper, please make it funny. <laughs> <laughs> Please make it funny. We'll help you out. We'll we'll, we'll send you a script. You get you get a copy from Pernell. Um, you just have to like figure out how to read his handwriting, and then you're good. So what you're just saying is in the mail. they're, they're going to be getting chicken scratch in the mail. Like how what juice de wo ah sapple dibble. But um, yeah, Sam. But I uh, know I'll, I'll read everybody's name at the end of the, today's episode normally. Um, so I, I I do I do thank everyone so much. Um, I just wanted to change things up, and I think this is a cool way to do it. There's a lot of names. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but this way people actually can get to be like part of like the radio station and, and part of our show too. Um, so yeah, we might actually open up to do more stuff. Um, but like people like Patreons where like they make like plushies and and and, and uh, bumper stickers and they send them out. Like I don't I don't know if we'll get into that. So I mean I don't even know how to go about doing that. Nah. That's the thing. I mean, I could figure it out, but like, it's cool. I mean, I like doing a podcast, you know. <laughs> like, podcasting is fun. Your podcasting is fun. That all this other stuff is fun too. Grapefruit is and, delicious, and grapefruit is so good. I disagree with you. That's okay. It's That's just, insane. Grapefruit's not for me. All- Grapefruit's for everyone. <laughs> Grapefruit and vodka, maybe. Okay, now that I can, <laughs> I, I respect. <laughs> You say, all right, cool. That's legit. Okay, so this week's episode's also a little mixed up, like water ice and shaved ice and and Italian ice. You know why? Lincoln Pernod? ice. This all of today's episodes is all about games that have been ported to handheld. So and the music from those tracks. Yeah. So because so often the games, like especially the ones that were like early PlayStation games that went to Game Boy, they had nothing to do. Like the games were completely different. Like there was. Like the game, like they make a, a a PlayStation game that's like a 3D space shooter. You put it on a Game Boy, and suddenly it's a kart racer. You know, it's just, it's just they did stuff like that, and uh, and the music was it, often was often very different because it was a completely different studio doing the ports. The funny thing is, I'm actually anxiously hoping that I didn't already pick some of these because, like, I was like, I was like, this is obviously what I got to choose. But I'm like, there's no way. And I checked. I was like, it's not on the list. I, it didn't come up when I looked it up. So I guess I'm good. But we'll find out. So I, you're good at that. Yeah, I did some deep cuts. Um, I did some. I, I have one that I really want to play because it, it technically is an original, but the the series is not on it. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that when it's my turn. But right now, we're starting with Pernell's first track of the day. Funny thing is, like mine, I won't even say are deep cuts. It was more like, at least for this first one, it was a matter of like, wait, that got ported. Oh yeah, I never listened to it on the port version though, so I wonder what it sounds like, and it actually does sound different. Yeah, and I'm curious to know that when 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 we pick our tracks, let me let me know if you if you know if if it's an arrangement of the original from the game or if it's completely different. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think they're all generally arrangements. Like every track I picked sounds like the original track okay. from like his other incarnations, just 
different. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, this track comes from the game Final Fantasy VI, um, the Game Boy Advance version, obviously. And oh, yeah. I thought I said, obviously, like anybody in the... Yes, it got ported to the Game Boy Advance. Oh, it got, port it got ported to the Atari Lynx. <laughs> God, that would be a weird port. Um, and the track title is Decisive Battle, Ooh, which is cool. my favorite one from Final Fantasy VI. It's composed by Nobuo Uematsu. back you're listening to final fantasy 6 advance decisive battle composed by nobuo uematsu and i kid you not i went into my stack of game boy advance games say oh that game is a port i've never listened to the ost from it though in fact i never put this particular cart in my system at all i bought it just because i love the game and wanted to own it as a collector so i was like wonder what it sounds like popped it in well popped it in as far as this goes i was like holy crap this sounds so different from the original version of it like, you can clearly tell it's the same song. It carries all the major notes to it. But then there's, like, certain elements. Like, there's, like, that one part where it's, like, a lot of, like, gnashing. Yeah. I don't know how else to describe it. But it's, like, something that's definitely not in the original cut at all. <laughs> you know, I was actually, I was typing in um, the, the I, was, I was typing the composer Nobuo Uematsu. And I started typing in Nobuo Uematsu Advance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... He did advance yeah, to Game Boy. I, I do, I do like the sound of this. Right, it's it's almost like a slower tempo, and the guitar sound is like a little like harder. It sounds like a it sounds like a really generic like dun, 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 like they would use in like ra like a like like Road Rash, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I like it, the so a lot of the music on the Game Boy Advance um, was downsampled, so it was really gritty and had kind of like a hissy kind of static quality to it. But I think it really works on this track. I agree with you. Like I, I can see myself playing this version of it and not feeling disappointed. Mm. Like I could, like there were definitely games where I was like, I don't know how I feel about this compared to the original game. Like I remember Breath of Fire One did that to me. I was like, I prefer Breath of Fire on the Super Nintendo to the Game Boy Advance version. But this I like. <laughs> this I dig. And I think it can sit alongside the original. Like I still think the original is the superior cut, mm -hmm. but. I think this can sit alongside it and be something I can appreciate in future listens. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, I think this might be my favorite battle theme from Final Fantasy. Like the more I hear it, the more I think it's just so. It's one of the best, if not the it, best. It is like yeah. I hear like you know people say those who fight further from <sighs> seven and like force your way from eight. People name all the other. Ones. No, they're great. And yeah. While they're good, they are good. This one is the one I always go back to. Yeah. Like, this is the one where I want to feel like this in seven. I will say seven does still hit the notes, but this one is the one I most likely go back to mm -hmm. to want to feel pumped about like a boss battle. Oh, this makes me feel like I'm in the middle of something. The um, it's that organ, that organ like solo. It's so so awesome. And um, there was a commercial. I was watching Hulu the other day, and there was a commercial for the Final Fantasy VII remake. And it started playing the um, um, uh, the the new arranged soundtrack for those who fight further, mm -hmm. and I was like, it got me like really pumped. I was like, yeah, I haven't. Was really... it good? It was so good, and I, I don't have you know what I mean. I don't have a whole lot of nostalgia for Final Fantasy VII, but I've been yeah, I'm curious about it. It looks cool, and that got me really interested. Like that commercial was enough to be like, you know what? Maybe I should play this game. <laughs> I agree. Honestly, my take, I haven't played my copy. I sitting down there. I even spilled tea on it, which made me really frustrated. But I lucked out. It was still shrink wrap, so oh, good, I, had to good. I had to unwrap the shrink and immediately, you know, <laughs> separate 
liquid from casing. <laughs> so oh my, my game, my copy is no longer in shrink, but at least it's dry. That's good. Um, yeah. But like, it, it, honestly, like my take on it is, I wasn't exactly geeked for it because I wasn't that attached to seven. I was about as attached to seven as typical next gen. You know, chasers are like, this is going to be the next Final Fantasy. It's on a next gen console. Gotta play it. But beyond that, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a lot of people were like, this was my first RPG. I love it to death. You know, this was my first Final Fantasy. For me, it was like, it's just another Final Fantasy. It's just on a new system. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. And I had fun with it. But in the end, it doesn't have those notes. I don't hold it in this, such as iconic. You know, level as a lot of people do. Aside from the cultural impact that it had, I'm gonna have a, I am gonna have a really hard time with seven. And the only thing that's really holding me back is the lack of, like, a wait mode battle system. You know, I thought that's right. But did it not have access to a wait mode? It says that there, it's in there, but I don't. I gotta watch like some. I gotta Just watch go to the, some videos and see because I don't believe that it's it's not like what I would I can, want it to be. You know, I could literally check for you before I go to bed if you want. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's just a matter of. Are you talking about the new one or the original? A seven, the original. Oh, the original definitely has. No, 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 a no, no, no. I mean, seven, the, the remake, the remake. The oh, remake. oh, yeah. remake. I'm sure it does. It's. Um, well, I know. I'm, I mean, they talked about it. I know it does, but like, I don't know if it's worth it. You know, is it like going to slow the game down to a crawl, or is it? Well, of course, be- it's going to slow it down. It's wait mode. It's just. It's a matter of. It'll be about as fast as you can pace yourself. To <laughs> it's be. in the name, Rob. You're waiting. <laughs> it's just the wait mode, not the get off your butt and get frantic mode. All right. Wait. Before I uh, before I drag that out any further, I am going to play uh, my first track. And I'm gonna start with okay. So wait mode. <laughs> wait mode. One of the um, I'm gonna wait for it now. Wait for it. Wait for it. The um, one of the common themes that I found was a lot of these PlayStation games that were ported to the Game Boy. Is one the game is different almost every time, and two they tried to emulate guitar sounds on the Game Boy Color, and it's actually really cool. So um, this is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Two. For the Game Boy Ooh. Color. Well, this um, is a good thing. This is theme number three, and this is composed because because you know Tony Hawk Pro Skater is all licensed music. So this yeah, is all original music composed by Kiyoshi Kusatsu and Yoshio Watanabe. listening to theme number three from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 for the Game Boy Color. And um, this one's composed by Kiyoshi Kusatsu and Yoshio Watanabe. And, mm-hmm. yeah. So you can see what I mean? Like they tried to make it sound like, a, like an electric guitar or like some kind of synthesized electric guitar. It still feels grungy, but it's not quite grungy. Yeah, it's, it's a short track. It's one of the shorter tracks in, like, that's on the cart. But I just I love the way they they made that kind of riff sound like actually sound like a riff sound like didn't dig didn't dig didn't, didn't you know mm-hmm. um, I think it's cool I think it's really cool honestly I I do feel as though with Tony Hawk particularly kind of like how Crazy Taxi is it's the licensed music that is a large part of what makes the game what it is to me like iconically but if I were trying to get a hit of it on the go I wouldn't kick this out of the card either it's yeah. just but if I had to prefer, of course, I'm going to go with my crazy, I'll go with my tunes. Like, I'll play now. Like, I, if I boot up Tony Hawk 2, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly, I couldn't, I don't remember being able to choose the track. It would just play something in a cycle. So, I would boot up a, a level, and then I'd go, okay, this isn't the track I want. 
but I guess I'll play through it. But then when the track I wanted kicked in, oh, that's going to be the best run. That's the run that's going to make it. I love that. I love that. Like when it's like, oh, and the beat starts hitting and you're like, yes, yes, going to get this one. I'm going to nail mm-hmm. it. Uh, that's Bad a- Religion was a big one for oh, me. Yeah. Bad Religion came on. Let's get a high score. Now, for the Game Boy, it's a little different. Um, have you ever played the game Ali Ali? I had. The, the one that's like left to right side scroller? Yeah, that's what this game looks like. Most 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 of the stages are like that, kind of left to right side scrolly. Oh, so it's not like a fakey Game Boy Advance 3D? No, I don't think they could have done that on the Game Boy Color. Um, and if they did... Oh, this could, is Game Boy Color? Yes, yeah, it's Game Boy Color, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's about all you're going to get is 2D on yeah. that. And I did look at Crazy Taxi for the... Um, I think it was for the DS? It was, no, it was for the GBA. And they actually did like a 3D situation on the GBA on the Game Boy Advance, and um, it's real bad. But they did it. <laughs> but it's yeah, real. it was probably like how, like, because, like, Mario Kart did it on there, where it was, like, a, it was not Mode 7, but it was, like, their version of Mode 7. Yeah. That would work on there. So I can imagine Crazy Taxi doing something akin to that. But, like, Tony Hawk's, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater is such a really specific style of game that they couldn't, if they couldn't emulate it perfectly on, on another system, they had to do, they would have to make something completely different, so... So they did. I mean, it could have been like Skate or Die when like it went from Skate or Die to Skate or Die Bad and Red, and it's like, well, we can't make it Skate or Die, so let's just make it this weird action platform. Oh, I love that game. Instead, it was so hard and it was so confusing. But the music was great. Uh, I still hum the 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 when the level when you're surfing on the drive, riding your skateboard down the beach, and it's like a wave to rush, like doo doo doo. Ah, uh, I'm gonna get weird about it now. But um, well, that's, one of my fa- that's one of my favorite composers. Rob Hubbard did the music for that game. So just saying right there. You love that music? You love Rob Hubbard. Well, they, they that that nails it then. I love that music. Yeah. All right. So you were saying? So I did have... There was like two wacky things that did happen today that I felt I should mention, which is mm. funny because you would have thought these would have been the things that made the day really better. And they kind of did. But, you know. So first thing that I wanted to mention was... This actually happened last night. Um, I was in my kitchen... Got a random Facebook tag from a friend who was like, I was vacuuming the floor and this jingle kicked in. And I was like, I, it made me think he's, I wanted to share it. And it was like the theme song to Growing Pains. <laughs> Basically, she and I are like big friends. Of, we're big when it comes to like talking about like old TV theme songs and singing them and stuff. So, yeah. So she shared that. And like, hey, cool. So I was listening to it and I went down the TV theme song rabbit hole. I was listening to all oh, Mr. Belvedere, Step by Step, Getting By. <laughs> and... I got to Laverne and Shirley, and I was like, hey, look what you did to me. I'm in your kitchen cooking, listening to Laverne and Shirley and singing it, and I sent it a link on the Facebook page. Kid you not, a minute after I sent it, I got a message notification on Facebook saying, Penny Marshall likes your comment. Now, for those who don't know, Penny Marshall is the name of the woman who played Laverne in Laverne and Shirley. What? Now, obviously, this wasn't the same Penny Marshall, but you still got her figure. What are the odds of someone specifically named Penny Marshall liking or reacting to anything I said on Facebook? Because I don't know anyone named Penny Marshall. (laughs) (laughs) So it was like a really creepy coincidence. Like, holy cow. So I had to share that with I was like, look what the heck happened. This could be my lucky day. And then today, um, a friend of mine who lives, like, in, like, upstate, up um, northwest Pennsylvania, made a Facebook post. I commented on it. And then another friend of mine, who lives in southeast Maryland, mm-hmm. commented, like, how do you know Purnell? And he goes, oh yeah, we were friends from way back. We worked on Mag 1 in 2002, and I knew him when he went to Virginia, when he lived in Virginia. So, then I responded with, wait a minute, you guys have the same last name. Are you two related or something? And they were like, no, I don't think so. And the girl goes, yeah, not unless he has, like, family in Idaho or something. Oh, and did he say yes? <laughs> no, he didn't. But another relative of his popped up and said, you know, back in the day, your great-grandfather visited, Ro- uh, you know, like, visited, like, you know, Virginia, mm-hmm. and he had a son named X. Started on this weird rabbit hole where they were going to family trees and asking their grandparents and all this uh-huh. junk. Turns out they're distant cousins. Oh they were God. able to trace it back to each other. They're related. No kidding. And it's like, we would not have known this if you didn't randomly just say, are you two related? <laughs> I was like, I'll be darned. This is a cool nod. Not only does like, it's like, they, I, they were, I was like a common thread between them. But like then it turns like, out they're actually related. They're like, I made this happen. 
<laughs> well, I don't want to, but they admittedly did say, like, if you didn't make this comment, we would have never even thought to take this dive, so we would have never known. Uh, wow, that's but amazing. It was amazing. Huh. Jinx, now you can't <laughs> speak till somebody names your track. Oh, well, you're next, so. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. What you got? Um, so, another case of I don't know if I picked this before on the show. It feels mm. like an obvious choice I would have picked for the show. And I couldn't find it when I went to look it up. So, rolling the dice. This comes from the game Blaster Master Boy. Um, it is the main theme from said game. And it's composed by Naoki Kodaka. So it's still so it's still the same um, composer then. Yes. And this is on the Game Boy. Yes. Are you sure? I'm kidding. Positivity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome back. You're listening to the main theme from the game Blaster Master Boy, composed by Shinichi Seiya. Did I say that? Yes, I did. I said that both times. You didn't hear anything different. If you did, you're lying! Um, so, Shinichi Seiya, Game Boy, Blaster Master Boy. This game is a game that I purchased, which I sadly don't own. I went to look in the box of Wonder, and it turns out I own Blaster Master Enemy Below now which is just an actual port of the original Blaster Master game. So, not nearly as cool. Hmm. But this game is a port of, though, is actually not Blaster Master at all. This is a port of a game that in Japan is known as Bomber King, but in America it's known as Robo Warrior. Oh, and this track, wow, that all makes sense. Yes, and this track is the main theme from Robo Warrior as well, but it's, of course, demade for the Game Boy. And in my opinion, it actually sounds wow. much better than the original track. And Robo Warrior is a spin-off of the Bomberman series. Yep. That's ah. crazy, isn't it? Now it's, it's, like it's, just... it's all making sense, Prunel. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. Like, I bought this game, and back when I did buy it, I was terrible at actual um, Robo Warrior. I never got past, like, stage two in that game. It's a, such a brutal mess. Mainly because of the need for using candles underground and the fact that your health cons constantly dwindles just from moving. Like, if you don't constantly find energy, you'll die from standing still. It's a frustrating oh, mess. Oh, I'm watching a playthrough now. I remember this game. Oh, man, this is rough. A Robo Warrior? Yeah. Blaster Master Warrior. A Robo Warrior. Yeah, it's such a rough game. Like, I wanted to like it so badly. I would rent it all the time, but just couldn't hack it. Blaster Master Boy took the gameplay of Robo Warrior but made it digestible for the common man by not having your health constantly deplete. You still had the cool underwater, underground exploration, which I do recall needing candles and stuff for. But again, without the depleting health, everything was more manageable. It didn't put a, a needless clock on me. Mm. So. And I actually did manage to complete Blaster Master Boy multiple times. I love the music in the game, even though it only really has three themes. It has the main theme, the underground theme, <coughs> and the boss theme. Pardon. And that's all it needs. Okay, a title theme too, of course, but whatever's. So, yeah, this is a game I still recommend people playing today if they have access to a Game Boy in the cart or ROMs. Mm -hmm. um, this music track hopefully got earwormed, earwormed for you like it has for oh, me over it, the years because I still jam to it. It's incredible, man. This this has got so many movements to it. I mean, this is one of the best Game Boy tracks I've heard in a long time. It's iconic to me. Like this is. This is meaty potatoes. Mm. This is good. I mean, this is really, really good. 
This I, is a this is a black olives and fettuccine Alfredo pizza. Yeah, man, this is like this is like uh, broccoli and olives on the same pizza. I would eat that pizza with a cheesy crust. Oh man, and oregano all over it. I would eat it. That's that's this track that. right here. Okay, my next track for now may not be well. For the game, might not be that kind of pizza, but the tracks are. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so um, how classic do we want to go? We're talking like Mozart, or okay, we are gonna go with. No, we gotta do this one. We gotta do it. This is from the game. No, going back. This is from Test Drive Six. Test Drive on the Game Six Boy? for the Game Boy Color. This was released on the PlayStation, <laughs> on the PlayStation One, and then ported to the Game Boy Color. And guess what, Purnell? It's an RC Pro Am clone. <laughs> oh my god. That's, that's a good clone to me. I know, it's still fun, it's still it's but it's not, definitely not. And again, Test Drive 6 is one of those games that is just full of licensed music. So this game only has one track on it. It's the title theme. And I hope you enjoy it. It's really cool. It's um I believe it was de- uh, was developed by Infogram. Um, the uh, the French development company. Oh, so, Infogrames. Or Infogrames, yeah. It's inf- Infogram. And uh, <laughs> we don't, I don't know, there's no composer or arranger listed for this track, but I do believe it is original to this title. So this is the title theme from Test Drive 6 for the Game Boy Color. This is the title theme from the game Test Drive 6 for the Game Boy Color. The composer is unknown, but it's a jam, man. This is like, this guy, I got stank face on this track. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh man. Composed by Mr. Mixix Pickman. Yeah, so good, man. Man, this is like, this is like, this is like pineapple and ham, honey baked ham on a pizza. We just need to go get pizza. <laughs> we, just, we just clearly want pizza. When this episode's done, I'm eating pizza rolls because I don't have pizza in the house. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh, this is great! Like something about like I knew that I knew this was going to have a game that sounded a lot like maybe the original Test Drive music for for the Amiga, which is some really really. Wait, rock. is that where the game originated from? Was the Amiga? If not originated, then it's just got a really classic soundtrack on, on there on, <laughs> the, on the Amiga. But it's really good, and it reminds me of that. So uh, maybe maybe it's the same or similar maybe they were trying to do it in that style but it's really cool i love the way it sounds on the game boy on the game boy color so uh, the game boy color i think has the same sound hardware as the game boy uh, the normal game boy except that you can do um maybe like the normal game boy you can do i believe it's a sawtooth wave instead of a triangle wave um so you can get kind of more of a pure crunchier tone and you can do stereo effects which you couldn't uh, do on the NES. I'll wait for you to say something about arpeggios. Darn it! There is the, hey, there's some arpeggios in this track. Man. <laughs> like unlike the Game Boy Basic, Game Boy Color lets you do lots more arpeggio effects. <laughs> <laughs> like oh yeah, arpeggio, yeah, I'm on that. I got that. Oh yeah, getting all up, getting all up in those arpeggios. <laughs> I'm that I'm that guy that has like a faux understanding of it. I was like oh yeah yeah, I'm, I'm a sound guy. Yeah, arpeggio. See, I got arpeggios. I got those all over the place here. Um, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's just I really like it. I, I like the sound of it. I feel like also the Game Boy Color was a it was like a generation where 
the PlayStation was coming out, you know, um, Red Book Audio and live instrumentation was being used, or at least sampled sounds were being used more frequently in, in uh, game music. So the people who were programming and doing audio for the Game Boy, I feel like got really good at it. Like at this point, they really were just throwing everything into it. And it sounds so good. It does help in a way that the Game Boy, at least in my thoughts, the Game Boy was around for so, so long. Like if you really think back on it, unless I'm forgetting something, the Game Boy was around for longer than any console has ever been. Game Boy came out in 88, and it didn't get re- it didn't get retired until minimum 98 when the Game Boy Color dropped. Because there were like, it was the Game Boy Pocket, but it was just a nicer screen um, and a smaller unit. Game Boy Color added some stuff, basically, but it wasn't exactly a huge leap, you know? What? It wasn't until, I don't think it really got truly retired until the Game Boy Advance. No, I don't think so either. Um, and that was 2001. <laughs> yeah, the uh, Wikipedia is telling me 2003 was when it was finally like put to bed. Um, I don't know about that. You mean the Game Boy itself? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, yeah. So the Game no, Boy, it's totally true. Yeah, the I Game mean, Boy to the Game Boy Color spanned until 2003. That's incredible, man. Wait, you said to the Game Boy Color? Oh, you yeah. said basically when the Game Boy Color stopped. Yeah, that's a I'm, that is a, no, that is that's a long time. It makes sense though because so like I said, it came on '88. Um, that's when I got it. I love that little box. Um, and played it, and then even when the Game Boy Advance came out, the thing was that licensed game companies were still putting games on the Game Boy Color mm. because that's what a lot of people, a lot of kids still had. So the parents were coming to the store saying, what can I get for little Jimmy? Or well, we got this new Game Boy Advance game. Well, I ain't getting him that. He's too young for that. He's still got a Game Boy Color. What do you have for that? Well, we have this Nicktoons Rocket Power game. <laughs> you know, yeah, have... there's a lot of those like Rugrats games on the Game Boy Color. It's we had a ton of them at the oh, store. Yeah. We used to keep them like in a, like, we, had a lot, we had a lot of loose carts. We had a lot of just like random boxes stacked up. And they got to a point eventually where we were phasing out the Game Boy Color, but we still just had boxes of random games in the back to just drag out if a parent was like determined to get a Game Boy Color game, wow. but they weren't even front facing anymore. All right, so here it is. The Game Boy came out in 1989, right? The Game Boy Pocket. Was it 89? 89. The Game Boy Pocket, which is just a smaller version of the Game Boy, came out in 96. Ooh. And then in 98, the Game Boy Color came out. So I was right about that. Yeah, and then it wasn't until 2001 when the Game Boy Advance came out. I was right about that. Yes! I, wow. my, I'm not all bad, baby! That is incredible, man. Like, that, that, is, that is a long lifespan for a little little system. It's just the games were fun, you know? Like, they were just it a good ran time. The, it ran the gamut. Like, um, it just... It was something that I felt was sorely needed, and even when all the consoles were bumping up, and people were like, well, now who's going to play a Game Boy? The fact is, as far as handheld gaming went, Game Boy was still king of the heap. And even though there was the links that came out and the Game Gear, yeah. they didn't, to me personally, they didn't measure up in other areas. Like, for example, the Game Gear, oh, you have color. It looks a little nicer. Yeah, the problem is that scrolling. Any game that scrolled on the Game Gear drove me crazy. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Links, I don't want to talk about the link. Um, Turbo Express, <laughs> um, expensive, and a battery hog. Yeah. Um, well, that was just a whole system in your hands. Like, yeah, a, re- like a regular old Turbo Graphics system, just ready to go. Yep, and I think it retailed it for 300 bucks when it came. It was either mm. two or $300 on, on release. Yeah. Um, so no one was really buying that as a toy for their kids. And yeah, just, I called it a toy. The it's Sega, a toy. yeah, right. Yeah, you want to fight me? I know the uh, the <laughs> Sega, the Sega Game Gear had some incredible games for it, but it just chewed through batteries like no one's business. Mm-hmm. I just, I, I mean, I listened to Anthony. Um, I know he would, he and I would fight about it constantly. Where he'd be like, "Oh, don't you talk about Pernell? The Game Gear was where it was at." I'm like, "No, it wasn't." I, I look back now, on, like the games that he would talk about in school, I'm like doesn't measure up to the Game Boy in any way. It just doesn't. But, the, old, um, the old console wars. I, 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 I won't lie. I, I miss them. Like, <laughs> and to be more specific, I miss them from a youthful perspective. Because yeah, I know yeah. people that talk about them now, but they talk about them like a scary grandpa, scary adult who really shouldn't be talking about video games at this point. But back when we were kids, mm-hmm. there was a certain passionate fire about it. And 
it was partly fueled by the fact that, quite frankly, a lot of the kids just couldn't afford to get a bunch of systems. Yeah. Like, so they just rooted for the one they actually owned. Exactly. Everyone was talking about Nintendo, and I was like, I got my Genesis, and I love it, man. I love the games on the Genesis. So I just <laughs> it just made me love it that much more, honestly. And with me, though... Yeah. We like I said, we were lucky in my house where um, my mom had my brother got a Genesis for his birthday, but my uncle hand me down the Super Nintendo, so we ended up having both systems in the house, which mm-hmm. is a rarity in the neighborhood. In fact, we were the only neighborhood kids that had both systems in the house. So whenever the arguments came up, I was that one kid that was like, "Well, Genesis has merit in regards to Sonic the Hedgehog, but then Super Nintendo has the colors." You, with the colors, you get pop. And pop makes you feel like like you're experiencing something very joyful, like a soda. Um, like, I got re- I got really stupid technical, like, childlike technical about them all, yeah. but I was, the other kids were just like, Super Nintendo's better! <laughs> like, Look, there's got- marriage to both. Like, you got like eight bits? Rage. You got 16 bits? Well, how many more bits do you want? Right? We're so going like- to 32, baby. Yeah. That's how I actually made all my friends in high school, like my early launch of friends. Like I was sitting in the corner being all awkward and such, mm-hmm. and uh, I overheard the argument between Super Nintendo versus Sega Genesis, and uh, I couldn't resist jumping in on it. I was like, well, technically Super Nintendo has the better sound, which back then, it's kind of funny, back then a lot of most people would agree with that, but now as adults, I was like, well, technically no, this had an FM sound shit. <laughs> well, they're all, yeah, they're just they're just very different, very very different. The um, well, like, yeah, the Sega Genesis was like the uh, the architecture and the sound was what they were doing. It was what they were using in the arcade machines at the time. So that's just what they stuffed into a, a home console. You know, they like, did man, like, they did the same thing with the Sega Dreamcast. And like and what, to put some perspective on what I said earlier about how an adult would argue it. Like I have a guy I know on Facebook. He's a friend of mine, and I get on him about it all the time. Or like he's a big fan. He's all pro Xbox. Like. Xbox is top dog. Mm-hmm. Sony is like Xbox is yay. Sony is poop or whatever, <laughs> and like to like absurd levels even. Mm. And whenever something good happens with Sony, he'll post it with a means of trash talking it, like just down talking it like it's junk. And I'm like, have you ever just you know sat back and enjoyed the games you had access to? I know you can afford all of them. I know you can afford to get both systems if you wanted to. Mm. But if you don't buy them, you're being economically sound, and that's totally cool. You know, it's funny is, is the way I play games, and which is not often or not or not like a lot of different games at one time. Like they're all the same to me. Like. I don't care. Like the 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 switch is a little different because it's just it's all you can't play Nintendo games anywhere else. But like the the Xbox and the PlayStation, to me, they're they're just about the same. Well, they because because they are. If yeah. you really lay it on the table, game consoles, it's all about just what games can you access on the machines themselves. Right, right. And now once it's you like, get past yeah, that, yeah. And, unless yeah, you're a big yeah. studio and you're doing like a like an exclusive release to one system, then it doesn't matter because a lot of times they're just going everywhere. I've never heard of a person that was like, I played this game on the Xbox One, but then when I played the PS4 port, I realized the music wasn't as high quality. Like, uh, it's the same freaking music. And then uh, you also got to figure, graphically, anytime graphic differences come into play, it's usually something that, for me at least, is negligible. Like, well, the shadowing effect is slightly off. Like, I don't care about that. Yeah, it looks the same, man. Like, a current... (laughs) The debacle for this was uh, Trials of Mana, which recently came out. It got released on PS4 and on the Switch. Now, mm-hmm. technically, PS4 is leaps and bounds over the Switch. It's not that's not enough for debate. But um, my eyes are my thought is usually that when a game is released on both the Switch and another more powerful console, chances are whatever concessions that get taken to put it on the Switch are going to be minor because they had to develop the game. With the understanding that it was going to need to be able to play as close to perfection on the Switch as possible to measure up and get sales, you know? So, a lot of reviews were like, eh, this version is nothing, this version is nothing, nah, 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 nah. Compared to the Switch version, is not the one you want. But, uh, recently in Rhythm and Pixels chat, I think it was Jesse, um, Game That Tune. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he oh. was playing it, and he was like, I love this game. I was like, oh, you got it on the Switch too. I was like, give me some thoughts on it, because I bought it on Switch, because, you know, Pilar's playing it. And, he, and now he's playing, and I just wanted that handheld portability. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I was like, did you feel as though it lost something on the Switch that you wish you got on the, by buying the PS4? He's like, no. 
anything, it's perfect for the Switch. This is what I wanted for. I'm like, my man. <laughs> now I feel good. I'm ready for this thing. So as soon as I'm done playing uh the, the version from some collection of Mana, I will likely jump over to that one. Because I want to see how they changed it between the two games. So, but what were we talking about? Grapefruit? Oh, we were talking about the console wars, but we should probably move on to your next track. <laughs> All right, this is Console War Symphony. Oh, um, <laughs> no, it's not. Um, now I almost want to have a Console Wars episode. I don't know how we would flow it, how we make it flow, but I would love to try to have a goofy Console Wars episode hmm. as a theme. We could make, we could do something with that. Yeah. Um, this track comes from an uh, old favorite of mine. Actually, you know what? No, I'm going to play this track. I think the other track should be the end of the show. Track <laughs> yeah, because I, I, it's, I was having trouble picking things too. <laughs> so this track is an old favorite of mine, and it. Fits especially for me because I first heard it in this form, not in this original form. Um, this is from the game Mega Man 4 for the Game Boy, also known in Japan as Rockman World 4. Um, and the track is the Napalm Man theme. Hmm. And it's composed by Koji Murata. <laughs> just blasting off to Napalm Man from Mega Man 4 for the Game Boy composed by Koji Murata. That is so good, man. That's like, that's track of the show. That's amazing. And spoiler alert, if we ever do another Mega Man battle theme, this is going to get played from the NES version because I'm not going to let my ace in the hole go like that. Oh man, that's so good. And so, so, so so cheating. (laughs) Not cheating. It's legit. It's legit. Um, so... This boss was originally from Mega Man 5 on the NES. However, the thing that made Rockman World games unique was that they were considered to be their own unique plots. Quote-unquote plots for Mega Man games. Because just <laughs> typically, Dr. Wally did something stupid. Mega Man, stop that guy. Um, so, But it was still their own unique plots. And they would always meld... Two, they would melt two Mega Man games together. Yeah. So they would be like, okay, we're going to take half the bosses from Mega Man 2, and half the bosses from Mega Man 3, and that's going to be Rockman World 2. And then Rockman World 3 was Mega Man 3 and Mega Man 4, mm-hmm. and then Mega Man 4 was Mega Man 4 plus Mega Man 5. Um, but at this time, my family couldn't afford to get me a copy of Mega Man 5. So I never got a chance to play that game until you know emulators were a big thing or whatever. But Mega Man 4 on the Game Boy was already a much cheaper game, and I could be able to get it on sale at one point, which meant Pernell could get his own copy of Mega Man 4. And the thing that made me most excited about it was I could finally fight the Mega Man some of these Mega Man 5 bosses in this game. This should be a lot of fun. Yeah. And I immediately took to to Napalm Man stage and theme and weapon even. Like, I just like... I see his weapon was kind of janky. But <laughs> still, I like Napalm Man in all forms. And when I finally ended up hearing it on the NES, it was still good. In fact, a lot of people would say it is better. But for me, personally, this is the iconic version of it for me because this is what I heard it on first. This is mm-hmm. the one I was most attached to. It stuck. And honestly, this could be a fun, like, 
maybe this could be a fun thing to speed run against. Like, let's play through Mega Man 4 on Game Boy as a speed run. Mm. I, I, I wrecked this game something fierce. Well, one of our early, early episodes, we did a Mega Man boss battle with uh, my cousins, uh, Mikey and Rachel. And mm-hmm. Mikey, Mikey brought he brought with him uh, a suggested track from I think it was Elec Man from the Game Boy version, and mm-hmm. I never really explored the soundtracks on the Game Boy, and it was it was just arranged different enough. It had like more energy to it. There was more sound of like it was just so cool. I, I, I'd never expected that coming out of the Game Boy. I like that with these versions. What they do is they realize that they're they're working on inferior hardware by comparison, though. But I wouldn't be surprised if actually it turns out that the Game Boy actually was superior. But no, I believe it was inferior because wasn't it also mono? Uh, on the NES was mono, yeah. So the Game Boy had stereo. It had um, a, a wave channel instead of just you know it had a, two square waves. So, so they could do more on the on the Game Boy. Yeah, yeah. They, there was more potential there, and also like you know on on a new system, you know there's there's less. Um, uh, there's less expectation of what things to sound like, so they could do things a little differently. A little magical. Yeah, a little, add a little magic to it. Um, but no, this is excellent. This is super, super good. But um, because things are running late, I'm going to move to our next, our, our final track. And this is um, this is a port of Shinobi to the Sega Game Gear. Now, the Shinobi games on the Game Gear, though, are a little different. They're called GG Shinobi. And the, the G's oh, are like, Game Gear Shinobi. Yeah, the Game yeah. Gear Shinobi. So this is um this is G G Shinobi two, the Silent Fury for the good Sega game Shinobi. Yeah, good game Shinobi. That's what I thought. <laughs> no, but the the artwork is really cool. The G is like all stylized. Um, but it's officially G G Shinobi two, the Silent Fury, and this is by Classic, some of the best. You know them. They are the dynamic duo from Street Streets of Rage two and three, Yuzo Koshiro and Mochihiro Kawashima. Listening to Building Two from the game GG Shinobi Two. Good the, game, Shinobi. <laughs> the Silent Fury for the Sega Game Gear, composed by Yuso Koshiro and Motohiro Kawashima. Um, yeah, wow. This this whole soundtrack is actually really amazing, and um, and, and from what I've read, the game isn't so bad either. The uh, the so there's some YouTube playthroughs of it. You can watch it, and, and um, for for a Game Gear game, like they've got it's some amazing, like the the color range and the sprites that that move around the screen are, are really fast. It's really cool looking. I mean, it's still if you're into Shinobi, Shinobi's kind of a slower side scrolling type game. Um, but the, the soundtrack is um, the the first one was was uh, Yuzo Koshiro, and this is Yuzo Koshiro and Mutohiro Kawashima together, and it's it's just a beautiful blend of those two sounds. It's really cool. I was bopping to it. Yeah, it's it's amazing. This is my favorite. This is this is my favorite track off of the uh, off of the soundtrack. This is a honestly the Shinobi franchise. That's one I need to bring back next. I miss those games so much. But they're, they're but not like Ninja Gaiden where they made it like a super hard 3D game so much. I don't I don't think I would need it to be that. I honestly would like them to bank more on the speed elements of Shinobi. Yeah. Because when I play Shinobi three. What I remember most about that game is when I got good at it, I would just like blitz through things, like run, stab a guy, he just got that weird like slash and dash he did, and he'd yeah, like grab yeah, the elevator like, and ride up. He would like dive forward with his knife and he can keep moving. Like as yeah. long as if you knew when the enemies were coming up and you, and you knew the spacing of things, like you could time it. So like it just like the stages, but you had a really good flow to it. Yeah, like I yeah. feel like Ninja Gaiden capitalized on its difficulty level by making the the updated versions of it really difficult too. Mm-hmm. Like Shinobi to do the same thing would be more of a retread, mm-hmm. not really worth 
it wouldn't feel unique. Look, yeah. they, they work with the speed element in the, in the ninja flow, we'll call it. Um, I think a revival of Shinobi would be fantastic. Yeah, I think it'd be cool. And Shinobi really has that like kind of 80s ninja movie vibe to it, though, which, I, I, which is back then was kind of silly in the 90s. But now, in 2020 world, I'm down with it. I want a cool uh, neon, you know, 1980s ninja movie again. But I do want them to keep the, the cyber tech influences in there, too. Yeah. Like, even though he himself wasn't particularly a cyber ninja, he always went end up on like some kind of like cyber base or fighting aliens yeah. or whatever. Fighting robots. Yeah, like, what is he doing? How is he slashing through robots with a sword? Because he's Joe Musashi. That's how he's doing it. Yeah, but, he's, um, the, he's the shadow dancer. <laughs> I actually like Shadow Dancer a lot too. Yeah, me too. I remember. I remember when that came out on the Genesis. I played that alongside of uh, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. Yep, that's and what that, that's what Russell had too. He had I, them both. And I was like, I remember getting confused, being like, "Is Michael Jackson the Shadow Dancer?" <laughs> like I was expecting more dancing in Shinobi because there's a lot of dancing in in, in Moonwalker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shinobi is just all about sicking your dog on. I'm oh, sorry, Shadow Dancer was sick your dog on him and then punch the guy. No, no, yeah, uh, Moonwalker was all about sicking your monkey on people. Well, that Wait, was the you arc- couldn't control Bubbles in the Genesis version, could you? No, that was the arcade version. You, you, hey. Bubbles would get on your shoulder and you would turn into a giant robot. Because ever- clearly the, 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 the catalyst was a monkey. Have you ever played the arcade uh, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker? Very loosely. I know it's like a, I know it like it's like a, it scrolls up and to the left. I know that much. Yeah, it's really weird. It's almost like an isometric like overhead view, and you can have up to four Michael Jacksons. And um, Michael the, Jackson. Yeah, you have the Michael Jacksies, and you have to uh, you have to save children. And if you find Bubbles the the monkey, he jumps on your shoulder, and you turn into a robot, and you shoot all the bad guys. So strange. Get had, equipped with bubbles. They had it at the Pizza Hut that was over here on um, on Marsh Road. Uh, that's it's, that, it's that, that's a weird diner now, isn't it? But uh, still, I, I it's know. a nice diner. I love that place. I'd go over there sometimes for breakfast. <laughs> um, but yeah, I used, they used to have I used to play that in uh, Clax. Oh, in Rampage. They Wait, is Clax Rampage the game with too. the tiles that fall down? You have to like stack them. Yeah, I did like Clax a lot. I used to play on NES. Yeah, these yeah, games are. Clax. These arcade games are like these like these old classic ones are really hard to find now. You know, I think they're they're all collectors' items. But back then, it was just like like you were weird, in every you know. diner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was like, why? Why is this game? Why is it? Why is this game here and not like in the the mall arcade? You know, it's just do you want to play clacks or do you want to play clicks or do you want to play quicks or do you want to play quacks? I, I, as a as a little kid in like the early '90s, early early '90s, a Michael Jackson game was like the coolest thing in the world. You know? Oh yeah, because also because Moonwalker came out as a tie-in to yep. the movie Moonwalker. And if you remember Moonwalker the movie, that thing was a friggin' phenomenon. Between all the... Because if I remember correctly, Moonwalker the movie had a narrative, but it also sort had of, a lot sort of, of, like... <laughs> had a lot of vignette, like, videos slapped around, like that weird cartoon one where he was like a bunny. Yeah. And, uh, oh, that's... God, that movie was amazing back then. Such an amazing film. I'd yeah. watch it now. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Like, it's just so strange. So strange. 1988. Now, I do remember... I, think I, I remember being a kid and getting freaked out by... The, it was a video where, you know, again, it was the, the video where he was with the cartoon rabbit. And he was like, he wore the... He, was like, he had like a rabbit costume on. He was trying to hide from all his fans. So eventually it became this, like, this long-winded, like, vehicle, vehicular chase scene where all the fans were trying to chase him. He was, like, invading each and every one of them. And at the very end... There was like one giant car that had every single fan on the same car, and they were making these like really creepy faces. Like, is he like a secretly terrified of his face? Because <laughs> these guys, these clay versions of them are scary as crap. But um, it was such an amazing video, despite the jarring aspect of some of the fans that he, that he they animated for. Oh, so, wow. and then the, of course, then eventually the suit comes to life and they dance. Yeah, there's um. That's the thing with like uh, like rap music videos, not now, but maybe like ten or twenty years ago, where like they would release like these ten minute long things that told kind of a story and like the guys were coming up and and um, and there's like a whole like a story and then there's like a story bit in between like in the middle of the song and a story thing at the end of the song. Like Michael Jackson was doing that long, long before anybody because he was so so popular. Like Thriller was super long. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, oh, what was that one where he's like in Egypt? 
I don't even remember now. Yeah. That's a good question. I think it was. Uh, I think that was black and white. No, no, black and white wasn't Egypt. I remember black and white was at the one where the end where everybody was like kind of turning their heads left to right, <laughs> and they were just like it was a black person, now a white person, it was a black person, now it's a white person. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good song though. It, oh, I still listen to it. Like it was a fantastic jam, and oh. it was also an uh, event. If I remember correctly, when that video came out, it pre- premiered live. Not live, but it premiered on prime time at like mm-hmm. eight p.m. And like two channels aired it, and everybody got around the TV to watch Michael Jackson's new video. Like yeah. it was, it was ridiculous. And that was what we did. Mm-hmm. What was that? Well, there was one where he, um, he, he was dancing on top of a car and hitting it with like a golf club, and then turned into a puma and ran away. What was that? You got your memory on these is really. Cause I don't remember that one either. Maybe that was like a weird dream. I was, I was really young, but I loved it. Uh- I love I'm sure he had a it. video where something turned into a puma, though. <laughs> yeah, he turned into a cat. Someone's going to write it and be like, I remember that. I had nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this track's going down, and we're going to go into our bonus round. Doesn't matter. It's the bonus <laughs> round. <laughs> the bonus round is where we play covers and remixes and arrangements on our theme. And, and funny enough, this episode is all about arrangements. So, Pranel, what did you find? So I thought it'd be funny to find a, a cover for a Rystar game because Rystar did get a Game Gear port. So I was like, yeah, let's see what I can come across here. And of course, look for my favorite theme in Rystar to see Ooh. if anyone covered it. Yeah. And some awesome gent did. Um, so this track is the cover of the Busy Flare theme. That's the theme for Stage 3-1, the fire level. Yeah. And it's done by Gray Voice Music.
sounds cool. Mm. I'm here. I was just waiting to <laughs> get the. I wasn't. I was still compressing. <laughs> I was still decompressing from the amazing sound we just listened to. What is that? It is freaking busy, bloody freaking flare. Busy flare cover from Rystar, composed or rather covered by Gray Voice Music. Mm. This track was phenomenal to me. It is a cover of my favorite theme from the game Rystar. And I particularly like the fact that, well, one, that ending is a jam. Two, he rocked out well with the guitar, but I feel like the biggest shocker was the way he handled that one part in the track where music goes digga 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 like it was like like, a, like a, almost like it's like machines running in the background for a little period of the song, and he used that. I'm not even sure what that instrument was. You would probably have a better idea of it. Where it was like it sounded like a computer. Yeah, it's just some synthesizer sounds or something, but it, it blended really well with the rest of the track. I, I love the ending where it sort of like got all ambient towards the end. Yes, like it, the the that melody was like still kind of hidden in there, but it was just super. Di- I don't know. It's just really different. I, I love this interpretation of the music. I mean, it, you know, Bright Star is like one of my favorite soundtracks ever. So mm-hmm. that, that already, yeah, for good reason. Yeah, it already hits the hits the um, hits the spot for me. I listened to this track multiple times before even getting it on the show. <laughs> it's like what what's one more for a fantastic beat? All right, so we haven't had enough Game Boy. Yes. Um, so, never. Never. So uh, my bonus round track is coming from the Game Boy. It is um, the arrangement of Sagat's theme from Street Fighter Two for the Game Boy. And it is composed by Isayo Abe. And I would not have known about this track if it wasn't for Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Sound version um, uh, bringing this to me. So um, it's very, it's it sounds different. I love the way it sounds on the hardware. So I hope, hope you enjoy it. This is Sagat's theme from Street Fighter 2, and this is arranged for the Game Boy, composed and arranged by Isayo Abe. Um, I, I like was, this version of it, actually. It's cool, right? Like, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's got the chip tune sound to it, but it still has that weird time signature, but it's all condensed. It's a lot shorter. It's like way shorter, but it still has a kind of a cool jazzy keyboard solo in there. It has a little cool jazzy Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I really Perfect like... for when you're battling against Bob Saget. <laughs> did Jesse Jeff um, actually fight Bob Saget? I'm sure he did in some fantasy. I'm thinking about... Was it Celebrity Boxing? Did you ever watch Celebrity Boxing? Celebrity Boxing or Celebrity Deathmatch? No, it was Boxing. There was actually a There box- was a Boxing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, a Ron Polillo, and he fought somebody. <laughs> he fought a dude. He, he fought a dude, and he did not do well. Um, <laughs> I don't even picture how a celebrity boxing show could work well at all. Like, oh how many jacked stars are out there that are willing to go into the ring and box? For no, like no, no, they, they were not. They were not in good shape. It was uh, Ron Polillo and Dustin Diamond. Oh my god! I can, I can see why Dustin Diamond went through it. Yeah, he was like a, it was. Yeah, a, he wasn't going to be noticed. Screech versus Horseshack. Um, so. <laughs> If you have no idea what I'm talking about, that that's okay. <laughs> he is Squiggy in the ring. Now he would have put up a fight. A squ- oh, a Squiggy would have. Oh, yeah. I mean, also, um, Squiggy. Vernon Shirley again for yeah, you bring, youngins. Bringing that back. 
Um, anyway, for more information on the bonus round part of our show, go to rhythmandpixels.com and we'll have links to all of the artists' band camps and sound clouds and everywhere where you can buy the music and support the artists. And support Squiggy. And support the Squigs. Squigs. All right, thanks for joining us on episode 23-1 of Rhythm and Pixels. This is our listen to of handheld ports of other games. And what a treat it was. So yeah, pretty pretty heavy on the chiptunes, pretty heavy on the um, Game Boy, a pretty Game Boy heavy episode. Which honestly I'm fine with because I feel like I don't, well I think you probably agree with me on this too. I don't pick from the Game Boy or the Game Boy Advance mm-hmm. nearly enough because I never think to gravitate towards it. So sometimes having a direct push towards doing so mm-hmm. is a boost. It's a bonus. Yeah, that's why I wanted to do this this focus because it just kind of forces us back into our roots a little bit. It gets us back into some chip tunes and mm-hmm. and some and and I love I love the interpretations of some of these tracks and I love that some of these tracks are just completely different. You know. Just a completely different uh, group of people decided to do, do something different with the same, I don't know, the same characters and the same type of game, or the same name for the game. Um, I do have some uh, honorable mentions. I was going to play from Tomb Raider for the Game Boy Color. That was an interesting one. Um, Streets of Rage 2 for the Game Gear. That's also Yusei Koshiro. Yeah. Um, that, that sounds really cool in the Game Gear. Um, and then there was another Shinobi game, the first Shinobi for... Uh, Game Gear, but there, there's a bunch. There's a whole, whole bunch that I would have to find rips for, and I did not give myself enough time. So maybe we'll come back to this and do more of a Sega-focused side of things. That'll be fun. Yeah, I right. can make it work. It'll make it your, work. It'll be our Game Gear episode for now. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and what I have the least experience in gameplay-wise, but also be one more thing to talk about. Like yeah, I would. It would give me excuse to research the. Yeah, I mean, I know that you probably played more Game Boy games, but we all know the Game Gear was the superior console for now. We all know you've been drinking. You need <laughs> to really shut that down. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, if you want to uh, get in contact with us, if you want to say hi, if you have a track suggestion, or if you have a topic suggestion, we would love to hear from you. Please send us an email. Rhythm and Pixels at Hotmail.com. And if you'd like more information about our show, a full track listing from all of our episodes, and access to all of our episodes, check out our website. RhythmandPixels.com. And go to YouTube.com slash Rhythm and Pixels, and there is, uh, all of our episodes are uploaded there as well. And we also have a 24-7 radio station. It's a, it's a 24-7 stream playing nothing but 8-bit and 16-bit classics and deep cuts. And that's, that's, that's a great thing um, that we have going on there. Um, check us out on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. It's Rhythm and Pixels, all one word, usually. And if you'd like to support the show... Usually. Usually. I, mean, it's, it's, I know on Twitter it's different, but if you search for it, you'll, you'll find it. Um, and if you'd like to support the show, you know, tell people about it. You know, it's, uh, tell your friends. Or um, go to... Skywriting. Skywriting, yeah. <laughs> or you can support us on Patreon.com slash Rhythm and Pixels. And there you get access to uh, prequel episodes every week and a live stream recorded episode ev- once a month. Um, and uh, as I said at the beginning of the episode, we're going to have some updated um, little goodies for every tier level. But um, like every episode, I am going to uh, thank each and every one of you. Once I pull up the list of names. <laughs> Uh, Rob trying to find the list of names so he can read off all the patrons. I find it soon because I'm running out of words to say. All right, I got it. I want to thank that Nick Walker, Mike Myers. I want to thank our new Patreon member, Sonic Medley, and Taco, and Harold Howard, and David Taylor, and Reinhard Selkova, Andres Milberg, Dan Lafton, Phantom Jest, Steve Myler. The Autistic Gamer 89, Cameron Wawurma, Christopher Shenstrom, Bobby Arson from One Up Funk, Wicked Sasatafaroth, Carlos from the Heroes 3 podcast, Kung Fu Carlito, uh, Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Sound Version VGM podcast, Brian Pitt, Buttsbo, Hammock from KVGM The Last Wave, <laughs> uh, Johan Perez, Bruce Irons of The Mad Gear, 
Ed Wilson of the VG Embassy, Alexander Proudfoot, Davey Cakes, Das Dude, Das Last Weekend, Bedroth from VGM Very Good Music Podcast, Kitsurito, Solus Sanctuary, Mix Six Master, Damian Beckles, Joe Vasallo, OK Impala, Chris Murray, Chris Dienerson, Alex the Messenger, Messenger. <laughs> you took a breath! <laughs> I, did, I had to. That was great. Uh, Alex the Messenger, Messenger, host of The Messenger Presents, a VGM podcast, Messenger. And finally, David Smith. Um, who talks over Instant Messenger with Alex the Messenger about his show, The Messenger Presents. Thank you all very much. Very, very, very much. I, I love seeing your names at the end of every single episode, and it really it really makes us keep wanting to do more. It really boosts our confidence. It helps us get out there. helps us cook better. helps us eat more pizzas. It helps us do so much. God, I want pizza. <laughs> I want pizza. Well, we've right got now. we've got some great great topics lined up for the rest of this month, and then um, in a couple of weeks we have our live streamed episode. So, and we'll be announcing the topic for that one next week. All right. Yeah. So, thanks for listening to our show. My name's Rob Nichols, and I'm Pernell. Have a safe week, everybody. And remember, just because we're all on lockdown doesn't mean we can't occasionally get a nice bite to eat or a nice. Shaved ice, water ice, Italian ice, icy ice. You know what I'm saying. Ice baby. Snacks. <laughs> so, and I know that some people aren't bringing in money due to life situations, but for folks who still are, it definitely doesn't hurt if you have the means to. To every once in a while, just kick a buck or two to a local vendor who's also trying to hold down the fort because it's crazy for them right now. And... One thing I, I've been coming to grips with, like, I want to be able to be able to say that I did what I could for some local businesses because I want them to be around mm. beyond this whole thing. I like my pieces. I like my Thai. I like my water ice. I like my Indian food. And I'm hitting them up because I want that. I'm, I'm not, I don't want, I'm not ready to say goodbye to that nonsense yet. I want to eat, baby. Um, so just general thought there, you know, just support and contribute when you can. Don't overextend your don't don't go beyond your means, but just work within them. You know, mm. just do your best, do what you can. Yeah. I like that. Support your local businesses if you're able to. Mm-hmm. 